On April 12, 1945, American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt suddenly dies, less than six months after winning election to serve a record fourth term. But how did that last election play out? What concerns were there about his health? What were Roosevelt's final months actually like? I'm Andy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special about the latter part of Franklin Roosevelt's life. Okay, let's go back to the summer of 1944 and the start of that fourth election campaign. FDR, that's Franklin Delano Roosevelt, has been in office since 1933. He took office when over half the states had closed their banks in the depths of the Depression. After winning re-election in 1936, he won an unprecedented third term in 1940 by a margin of 5 million votes. When the war began, he balanced the demands of the interventionist and isolationist wings of American politics and public opinion before responding decisively to the 1941 Pearl Harbor attack. He then led America's transformation into a titanic war economy in the fight against the Axis powers. With the 1944 election on the horizon, though, Roosevelt faces a new set of challenges, bringing about the final victory against Germany and Japan and constructing a lasting peace in the shadow of the looming tensions between the West and the Soviet Union. But perhaps the greatest challenge of all for Roosevelt is his own health. By health, I'm not talking about the lower body paralysis he has suffered from since the 1920s. That wasn't really a factor in any of his campaigns, and the US public was well aware of it. You might be surprised to hear that. So maybe we can do a little bit of myth busting. People knew that Franklin Roosevelt suffered from a paralytic illness. He suffered that illness in the summer of 1921. At the time, and for long after, it was thought to be polio, but more recent medical opinion will claim Guillain-Barre syndrome. Roosevelt was already a well-known public figure at that time. He had been the Democratic vice presidential candidate in the 1920 election. After getting sick, he withdrew from public life for treatment and rehabilitation, and during that time, there was open discussions as to his health. In September 1921, the New York Times correctly reported that Roosevelt had lost the use of his legs, although they said it would only be temporary. Over the next two decades, he does often talk about his experience. He gives many newspaper interviews from the spa at Warm Springs, Georgia. He also campaigns for money for research for the fight against infantile paralysis and receives disabled children at the White House once elected president. And why isn't it a bigger deal, considering the general attitude towards disabled people in the 1930s? Well, what people don't necessarily know is just how disabled Roosevelt really is. Many people have no idea that he never regained any function below the waist. And he, his wife Eleanor, and their staff worked hard to create that image. Of course, they don't present him as being completely recovered from paralysis. That would be impossible. Instead, they build a picture of a man who fought hard to recover some of the function in his legs. This, they hope, will reassure the public that he is physically strong enough to endure the rigors of political life. In 1927, he gives an interview in which he claims that the curative effect of the waters at Warm Springs has allowed him to abandon one of his leg braces and to give up crutches for a simple walking stick. He also presents himself as living an active lifestyle, enjoying swimming, riding horses, and driving a car. But the reality is quite different. Sure, Roosevelt can swim using his upper body. He can ride a horse for a short time, too. And his car is modified with special hand controls. But the truth is that he is unable to walk unassisted, and in private, he uses a wheelchair. So, how do they maintain this fiction with the eyes of the world upon him as president? Well, he never uses the wheelchair in public. And instead, despite his claims to the contrary, he relies on heavy steel braces that lock at the knee and are covered by specially tailored pants. His administration also makes a deal with the press. No photos or films of him in his wheelchair or being helped into or out of his car. For the most part, the press obliges, but not entirely. His disability does not play a role in the 1944 elections. It's actually the decline in his overall health that might be the issue. This is particularly apparent after his return from the Tehran Conference in December 1943. After the 27,000 kilometer round trip, he develops a violent cough, begins losing weight, and suffers from extreme fatigue. In March 1944, a cardiologist diagnoses the 62-year-old president with reduced lung capacity, 
high blood pressure, acute bronchitis, and congestive heart failure. Although some of his symptoms improve afterwards, both that cardiologist and his personal physician agree that Roosevelt would not be able to complete another four-year term of office. But that does not put him off. His administration reassures the American public that their president is in the best of health. On June 9th, his physician, Ross McIntyre, tells the New York Times that right now his health is as good as at any time in the last year. None of his advisors or cabinet secretaries express any doubts publicly. Okay, that's to be expected, but his own family are also on board. Eleanor Roosevelt knows that her husband is weaker since the Tehran conference, but she will later say, I knew without asking that as long as the war was on, it was a foregone conclusion that Franklin, if he was well enough, would run again. Things are a bit different behind closed doors within the Democratic Party. Many leading figures are shocked by his decline when they meet him in person, and they too don't expect him to complete a fourth term. This means the choice of vice president assumes more importance. Many Democratic delegates and party leaders are no fan of incumbent Vice President Henry Wallace, who they consider too left-leaning. They put pressure on Roosevelt to dump Wallace and choose someone else. Roosevelt yields to the pressure at the Democratic convention in July and chooses Missouri Senator Harry Truman. Roosevelt wins the Democratic nomination, but the questions over his health become even more prominent when the presidential campaign really kicks off. His opponent, Thomas Dewey, is a moderate Republican who does support the United Nations and U.S. engagement in international affairs. His attacks on Roosevelt then focus heavily on the president's health and make claims that his tired government has been infiltrated by communists. Roosevelt's campaign strategy rests on his undeniable popularity and his status as wartime leader. But the Democratic Party leadership believes Roosevelt has to prove his strength and stamina. This is especially true as more and more photos of him looking increasingly frail are published. He is still capable of bursts of energy, though. On September 23rd, he gives a speech to the Teamsters Union at the Statler Hotel in Washington, D.C. The Fala speech, as it becomes known, goes down as one of his best performances. Time Magazine writes, the old master still had it. Franklin Roosevelt was at his best. Democratic Party Chair Robert Hannigan wants to capitalize on this with a series of rallies in New York, Pittsburgh, Chicago, and Cleveland. Initially though, and likely because of a combination of health concerns and war commitments, the White House announces the president will not be making any more public appearances. Hannigan, though, continues pushing for a big public campaign. And the White House agrees once negative headlines start coming out. So on October 21st, Franklin Roosevelt braves heavy autumn wind and rain for a motorcade tour of New York. Huge crowds turn out to see the president, who ignores recommendations of wearing a hat and coat. His speeches at the Brooklyn Army Base and at Ebbets Field are well received, and the New York Times reports that this puts to bed rumors of his failing health. The election itself is held November 7, 1944, and the final result is a decisive victory for FDR. In the popular vote, he wins 3 million more votes than Dewey, a 7.5% margin, and he wins the electoral vote 432 to 99. Soon enough, the time comes for Roosevelt to begin his fourth term. His inaugural address, January 20th, 1945, is the shortest since George Washington's second one in 1793. It's just five minutes long and is given, with little pomp and circumstance, at the south portico of the White House. With an eye on the post-war world and the United Nations, Roosevelt tells his audience, And so today, in this year of war, 1945, we have learned lessons at a fearful cost, and we shall profit by them. We have learned that we cannot live alone, at peace, that our own well-being is dependent on the well-being of other nations far away. We have learned to be citizens of the world, members of the human community. Two days later, he heads off for the Yalta Conference. We covered that in great detail back in February, so check that out. 
It is here that the other Allied leaders witness his decline firsthand. Winston Churchill's doctor notes that the president is a very sick man with only a few months to live. On March 1st, back in the States, Roosevelt addresses Congress to report on the conference. Interestingly, he opens with a rare public admission of his frailty. I hope that you will pardon me for an unusual posture of sitting down during the presentation of what I want to say. But I know that you will realize that it makes it a lot easier for me in not having to carry about 10 pounds of steel round on the bottom of my legs and also because of the fact that I have just completed a 14,000 mile trip. He elaborates on just what unconditional surrender means. Well, he's talking about Germany this day. And he tells Congress that the Allies will destroy German militarism, but not destroy Germany itself. This will all involve a temporary control of Germany by Great Britain, the Soviet Union, France, and the United States. Each of these nations will occupy and control a separate zone of Germany, and the administration of the four zones will be coordinated in Berlin by a control council composed of the representatives of the four nations. Unconditional surrender means something else. It means the termination of all militaristic influence in the public, private, and cultural life of Germany. It means for the Nazi war criminals a punishment that is speedy, just, and severe. It means that Germany will have to make reparations, but they shall not be in cash, but in factories, machinery, rolling stock, and raw materials. Roosevelt says, we do not want the German people to starve or to become a burden on the rest of the world. The speech goes well, but his health soon takes another turn for the worse. The round trip to Yalta on the Black Sea has really taken it out of him, but still he ignores the rest periods prescribed by his physician. Eleanor notes that her husband is unwilling to spend long periods of time with other people. Roosevelt arrives at Warm Springs on March 30th, 1945 with dark circles under his eyes, obvious weight loss, and an overall aura of fatigue. He hopes that a few weeks of rest will rejuvenate him ahead of the United Nations Conference in San Francisco, which is scheduled to begin April 25th. At first, this, this does seem to do the trick. The presidential physician notes, within a week, there was a decided and obvious improvement in his appearance and sense of well-being. He had begun to eat with appetite, rested beautifully, and was in excellent spirits. On April 9th, Roosevelt sits for a portrait by the artist Elizabeth Shalmatov. She later says that he was full of jokes and made very interesting dinner conversation about Churchill and Stalin. But that all changes just a few days later, the afternoon of April 12th, 1945. 4,422 days into his presidency, Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies of a brain hemorrhage. The White House announces the news later that evening and reactions quickly arrive from around the world. In London, the House of Commons adjourns as a show of respect. This is the first time that a foreign head of state has been granted such an honor. In Moscow, Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov speaks at length to American Ambassador Avril Harriman of the great respect that Stalin and the Soviet people had for the president. Harriman telegrams the State Department to say he has never heard Molotov talk so earnestly. In Berlin, Adolf Hitler greets the news with joy. Down in the bowels of the Führer bunker, he proclaims something along the lines of, here we have the great miracle that I have always foretold. The war is not lost. The response is somewhat different across the world in Japan, where new Japanese Prime Minister Kantaro Kangaroo Suzuki issues a statement pretty full of respect. I must admit that Roosevelt's leadership has been very effective and has been responsible for the Americans' advantageous position today. For that reason, I can easily understand the great loss his passing means to the American people, and my profound sympathy goes out to them. Hundreds of thousands of Americans line the route carrying Roosevelt's body from Georgia to Washington, and perhaps as many as half a million people turn out for the procession through the streets of the Capitol on April 14th. There's a private funeral at the White House after that, and the body is transported to Hyde Park, New York, where Roosevelt was born, for burial the next day. One significant figure missing from things, though, is Winston Churchill. Questions are raised. Did Churchill not attend for political reasons? Was it perhaps envy at Roosevelt's position as chief allied leader? Officially, Churchill's explanation is more prosaic. 
with other ministers out of the country, he says he is needed in Parliament. He sends Foreign Secretary Antony Eden instead. What is without any doubt is Churchill's strong affection for FDR. He telegraphs Roosevelt's advisor and liaison with Allied leaders, Harry Hopkins, I feel a very painful personal loss, quite apart from the ties of public action. I had a true affection for Franklin. Churchill will deeply regret missing the funeral. Roosevelt's administration has permanently altered the way the American government intervenes in public life. It becomes generally accepted that the government support those in need. The debate becomes a question of to what extent. And agencies established during Roosevelt's time, like the Securities and Exchange Commission, will continue to regulate the private sector. His democratic presidential successors over the next couple decades, Truman, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, will channel Roosevelt's legacy with their economic and social programs like the Fair Deal, the New Frontier, and the Great Society. In other aspects of public life, such as civil rights, Roosevelt's legacy is more complicated. He was popular among African Americans, Catholics, and Jews, but he also expelled hundreds of thousands of Mexicans and Mexican Americans from the country in the first half of his administration. Although to be fair, the Mexican repatriation began during the Hoover administration, and that's when the majority of the deportations happened. There's also the wartime internment of Japanese Americans, something Eleanor Roosevelt disagreed with. She will remain very popular post-war and will continue to advocate for the civil rights of African Americans and Asian Americans and those of war refugees. Well, what about international affairs? What would the world look like without U.S. lend-lease supplies to Britain and the Soviet Union during the war? Without millions of American troops who fought through North Africa, Europe, and the Pacific? Without churning out thousands and thousands of B-17s, Liberty ships, and Sherman tanks? As we saw a few years ago, there were plenty of people who wanted the U.S. to stay out of the war. And even as Roosevelt increased financial, industrial, and political support for the Allies in 1939, 40, and 41, he did his best to avoid direct involvement for as long as he could. In the end, even though his hand was forced by Pearl Harbor and Hitler's declaration of war, it's hardly an exaggeration to say that his choices ensured the survival of the liberal democratic world. Whatever the faults and hypocrisies of his and America's domestic and international policies, America joining the war enabled and hastened the defeat of the Axis powers. And not just that, his staunch opposition to imperialism and America's growing dominance of the Western world weakened the legitimacy of the British, French, and Dutch empires. Some of that definitely comes from a place of cold real politique. Britain is now saddled with massive debts to the Americans, and the decline of the imperial age can only strengthen America's position in global affairs. But all that is for the future, the world post-1945. It is now for Harry Truman to finish the job Roosevelt began. The war still rages on. Hey, I mentioned we did a special about the Yalta Conference, right? It is more of an extravaganza, hosted by myself and Spartacus Olsen together. It is also very interesting, and you can check it out when it pops up right here. It is the Time Ghost Army that enables us to do such specials as this one, and that one, and all of our regular series. So for ever more content, join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. See you next time.